the same passage that we were in last week. Last week we looked at the first half of the psalm, uh, considering uh, the worship of the Lord. And this week we will look at the second half of the psalm, continuing on with our thoughts about the worship of the Lord and what it means to us, uh, what it should mean to us today. But before we go any further, let's just pause and ask God's blessing on our thoughts this morning. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we do indeed praise you for uh, all of your blessings to us, for your Son, uh, for the salvation that we have in Him, for the blessing of your Holy Spirit and His presence in our lives. But Lord, we also thank you for the Word of God, uh, the Word of God that stands forever unchanged. The same yesterday and forever, even as you are eternal and unchanging. And we thank you that the promises of your word are as true and as certain today as when they were first revealed. But we thank you that every scripture of, uh, 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 is, is uh, given by inspiration of God and is profitable for us. So we pray that as we turn our attentions to your word this morning, that you will remove from our thoughts and minds anything that would distract us. Help us to be attentive, to listen to your voice as you speak to us through your word this morning. And uh, we pray that you would do us good for Jesus. Amen. The worship of the Lord is something that is central to the Christian faith. Yet what do we really understand about uh, this important aspect of the Christian life? What is worship? We asked this question last week. Many think worship is the music part of the service. We all stand up and, uh, uh, and sing some hymns or choruses together. We put our hands together and give the, the Lord some praise. But is that really all that worship is about? And to answer that question last week, we went to the Psalms as it seemed a good place to start. As any in Scripture, the Book of Praises, David wrote Psalm 34 to praise the Lord. For delivering him out of a particularly distressing time and experience in his life. And in the course of this psalm, David mentions several aspects of worship. And we looked at some of them last week. Verse 1. Blessing. I will bless the Lord at all times. And we noted that the root of that word blessing is to bow the knee. To bow the knee in adoration. So blessing God in, in this aspect is coming forth out of the humble heart. Thanksgiving for all of his blessings. And then the second part of the verse says that his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So worship is not only blessing the Lord, it's praising, proclaiming the greatness and the goodness of God, who he is and what he has done for us. As in verse 6, this poor man cried, this is David's testimony, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. So David is praising the Lord. And then verse 2. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear and be glad. So he's boasting, David says, but not in himself and in his accomplishments, but rather celebrating God and his accomplishments. And then in verse 3, we come across another aspect of worship, to magnify the Lord with me and to exalt his name together. All too often, our view of God is very small and, and limited. Uh, but to magnify God is to take something, to, when you magnify something, you take something that's small and make it bigger. And that's what we need to do with God, is to magnify Him. To take our small and limited understanding of God and magnify Him. For God is far greater than any human mind could ever conceive. So these are some aspects of worship and blessing, praising, boasting in the Lord, magnifying Him. We also noted a couple of other things about worship last week. For instance, worship is not just something we do in church on a Sunday. God is to be worshipped throughout the week. As the scripture says, verse 1, at all times and continually. We also noted that worship is something which can be done together. Now, yes, you can worship the Lord individually, and it's good and right, it's entirely appropriate for the individual believer to worship God personally and in private. But in this psalm, the aspect of worship that is mentioned is the idea of us to be, when we come together, something that we do together, 
with others. And so David says, O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And you know, a genuine Christian who has been blessed by the Lord never is content to keep God to himself or herself. We want to share it with others. We want others to share in the wonder and the goodness of God. And just like that, David says in verse 8, he says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. <coughs> Blessed is the one who trusts in him. And so David wants to share the blessings of God with others. So this is what worship is all about. But there's more to worship than just the act of worship itself. You can do the right things, but if your heart is not in the right place, then he worships in vain. And so in the second half of the psalm, David gets a little deeper with this whole idea and how we are to approach God. He talks about the kind of person that we ought to be if we would worship God properly. The character of the godly is seen not just in what you say, but in what you do. In fact, I venture to say it's seen more in what you do than in what you say, although what you say is important. People can hear your talk. And they can see your walk. But all too often, it, your uh, walk talks louder than your talk talks, if that makes any sense, right? The praise of the Lord needs to be in our mouths. Yes, we need to go out and proclaim the truth of God's word wherever and whenever we have the opportunity. But it is absolutely essential that our lives back up what we say. That our actions are matched by our words or vice versa. You can say what you like, but people are going to judge you by what they see in your character. If you're known to be unreliable or untrustworthy, then you can say what you like, but your words will always be taken with a grain of salt. If you have a reputation for dishonesty or cowardice or hypocrisy, people probably won't put much stock in what you have to say. This is why the Bible spends so much time talking about the character of a believer, what we are to like, how we are to live, the way that Christians are supposed to live their lives. And Psalm 34 is no exception. No sooner has David issued the call to join him in worship and to praise God, but he turns the spotlight onto the character of the worshipper. John chapter 4 and verse 23 and 24, remember this is the time when Jesus was meeting by the woman at the well. And he said to her, the Father is seeking such to worship him. And who is the Father seeking? Those that will worship him in spirit and in truth, from the heart, from the inside out. And so for God to be honoured, not just anybody can worship him, but the ones whose lives are pleasing in his sight, the ones whose lives match up to his holy standards. That's all by way of introduction. So with that in mind, let's look at the second half of the psalm this morning. Let's not worry about the person sitting next to you or the person across the aisle. Turn the searchlight of God's word on your own heart and let it shine in. Ask yourself, is my life pleasing to God? Do I bring him honour with what I say and with what I do? The qualities that are mentioned here in Psalm 34 are these evident in my life. Notice the first characteristic that David singles out. Verse 11. Come, you children, and hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. There was a time when devout Christians were called God-fearers. We don't use that phrase very much anymore. And, uh, and in those days, to be a God-fearer was a good thing. Nowadays, it's used more like uh, um, criticism contrast, the Bible describes the wicked as those who have no fear of God. Psalm 36 and verse 1. Proverbs 9 and verse 10 tells us it's the fear of the Lord is the beginning, <coughs> the beginning point of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So what does the Bible mean when it says the fear of the Lord? Well, first of all, you need to get rid from your mind any thoughts of terror or trembling in fear or cringing before a bully or a tyrant. That's not what is meant by the fear of the Lord. 
the best thing I can do to give us a likeness, some way to understand the fear of the Lord, is that fear that a child has from the mom and dad. Now, not the wrong kind of parent who is a bully or uh, 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 physically abusive, but the kind of fear that a child has for parents that love them. Now, I can understand that a little bit because I grew up in a home where my parents loved me. They took care of me. They provided for my needs. I never had to go home and be afraid of what mum and dad might do to me, unless, of course, I'd done something wrong. And then there was that healthy fear, that respect for mum and dad. And you know, I, I noticed myself, if you, when you start with your children with a little young and train them in the way that you go, and they know right and wrong, they know the limits and their boundaries, there comes a point where you don't have to discipline them nearly so much anymore. In fact, you don't have to discipline them hardly at all. And that was the case in our own family. Well, because kids get to understand what that pleases mum and dad and what doesn't. And there is a fear of disappointing, a fear of disrespecting your parents. <laughs> um, Lenny Henry, you know, the comedian, I, I saw him being interviewed one time and they asked him why it was that he, because he grew up in the 60s and 70s when the drug scene was big and it was a part of the lifestyle of these people, and he said, how is it that you never got involved? He said, because I knew if I, the minute I took drugs and came home, my mum would hit me over the head with an iron skillet. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if he was teasing or not, but, because, uh, but, uh, but the point he was saying is that there was a healthy fear, not because his mother was a, a, a cruel tyrant, but because his mother loved him and he knew it. And there was some, within him, he did not want to disappoint or disrespect his mother to hear him. So that's the kind of thing I think of when I think of the fear of the Lord in the Scriptures. Children, as we know, they need boundaries. They need limits placed on them. They need a structure of discipline if they're to thrive and to flourish. I know the same is true for us as adults, spiritually speaking. The fear of the Lord is having a proper respect for God and for who He is. A deep respect for God. Recognizing he isn't just anybody, but that we, we are indeed addressing the Lord Creator of heaven and earth. The one who but speaks the word, and it is done. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, the evil way, the mouth that speaks to and fro. I think that's quite an interesting phrase. It's what we say today, speaking out both sides of your mouth. These things the Lord says, do I hate? The fear of the Lord means being afraid to do wrong, being afraid uh, uh, to disappoint or to disrespect God. It's something that's rooted in love, a loving relationship with the Lord. The fear of the Lord means that even if no one else is watching, you know in your heart that God is still watching, that His eye is always on you, watching everything that you do. And so it is. Uh, uh, affects the way you live your life and the choices that you make. You know, the world would be a far better place today if more people had a healthy fear of the Lord. You can always tell when someone has a proper fear of the Lord. It's often revealed in a crisis. You know, when everything's going fine, when everything looks the same, but it's when the crisis comes that it reveals just how solid your foundation really is. <coughs> As it's often in a crisis that reveals whether or not the individual truly fears the Lord. Think of it this way. In a crisis, the one who doesn't fear God may say something like this. Well, if God were real, why would he let this happen? Who does he think he is? You know, when I get the chance to see God, I've got a thing or two I want to say to him. This world would be a better place if he would just leave us alone. Or some other such stupid comment. By contrast, the one who fears God, when they find themselves in a crisis, first looks inward into their own hearts to make sure that there isn't something there that ought not to be there. There is a humility, a quickness to confess any wrongdoing and to make things right with God. Someone who fears the Lord will trust God in every circumstance, no matter even if they struggle to understand, even if they can't make head or tail of why it's happening, I still know that God is good and that He loves me and I'm going to trust Him and He'll see me safely through. That's the difference between someone who fears the Lord and someone who doesn't. And so David asserts right here that true worship begins 
with a proper respect for God. And then he gets specific. Verse 13. Well, let's go back to verse 12. What one of you that desires life and loves many days that he might see good? Is there anybody there? You want, you want to live a good life and to be blessed? Verse 13, then keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. If there's any area in our lives where we're likely to fail or stumble, it's probably in what we say. James chapter 3 and verse 2 says that anyone, if anyone does not offend in word, the same is a perfect man. And I have to agree with that. And there's nobody perfect here. At least I don't feel very perfect. And, uh, and it's just true. Even with the best of intentions, we can easily be misunderstood. Or in a, a, an offhand moment, we can make a remark that could offend or hurt someone unnecessarily. Verse 13 spells, spells not only to speak, not to speak evil, but also to keep your lips from speaking guile. That's deceitfulness. Not being truthful. Intentionally misleading. Speaking out of both sides of your mouth, as we said earlier. Saying one thing to the face, and another thing behind the back. The Bible says, that's not the way we're supposed to be. If you want to worship God and worship Him from the heart, then that cannot be the way you act. Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, Jesus said, By your words you shall be justified, by your words you will be condemned. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was talking about the fact, again, about our speech. And he's saying, we're not to be the kind of people that go around cussing and swearing to get across our point. We ought to just let your yes be yes, and your no be no. And anything more than that uh, only comes to evil. We ought to be known for our honesty. We ought to be known for our truthfulness and integrity <coughs> that we can simply be taken at our word. I think I have to caution something here, though, because I know some people who say it like this. I always speak the truth, even when it hurts. And what the person means is that uh, they, they kind of take a perverse delight in telling the truth sometimes, even though they know it will hurt. Even though it will make someone feel uncomfortable. Or it might shame them in front of others. Or it might wound them to the heart. And then they hide behind the excuse, well, I was just telling it like it is. That's not what the Bible means by speaking the truth either. The Bible says we're to speak the truth, yes, but we are to speak the truth in love. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6 says, let your speech be always with grace. Always be gracious. Seasoned with salt. Uh, the little rule of thumb, you know, because I repeat it all the time, if you can't think of anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. And uh, that's a good rule of thumb for us all to follow. But here, David is mentioning the point that if you want to come to worship the Lord, then come to Him with lips that don't speak ill, that speak guile, deceitfulness, falsehood. David calls us to worship the Lord with the lips. That's what he says in verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times, and His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's what I want to talk about. To worship the Lord properly, there's some things that we ought to say. And there are some things that we should never say. God is not honored with praise from lips that are used to browbeat or bully others. To hurt or to wound another. To gossip or backbite. To slander or spread lies. James chapter 3 says, With your mouth you bless God, and then with the same mouth you curse God. Your fellow man. So these things ought not to be. Blessing and cursing ought not to proceed from the same mouth. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, Jesus observes that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. You know, what you say reveals what's inside sooner or later. You can tell what's in the heart by what they talk about. If there, someone twists the truth, it's because the truth's not in them. If they're critical or fault-finding words, then you've come across a critical, fault-finding kind of person. If they're angry or bitter in, with what they say, then there's anger deep within their hearts. If they're a positive and encouraging kind of person, that's the kind of person I want to be around. You ever notice how your mood is influenced by the kind of people you spend time with? 
You fall into company with somebody that's joyful and positive, who loves the Lord, and you just feel your spirits lifted. You can't. You you, you see them coming down the street, and you just feel yourself smiling because you know uh, they're going to be a blessing. And then there are other people. You know. <clears throat> Let's determine to be the kind of Christian whose speech is a constant source of grace to others, instead of being a stumbling block to those we meet up with. We're a constant source. of blessing. This is the kind of person who truly honors the Lord. And worship coming from this kind of person is worship that blesses God. If the praise of God is continually in your mouth, if that's what you're speaking about all the time, then you'll never be guilty of speaking evil. These two are mutually exclusive. So anyways, the true worshipper fears the Lord. The true worshipper speaks right. And then verse 14, depart from evil and do good. The true worshipper lives right. These are two sides of the same coin. It's not enough that we try to do good, we must also forsake evil. Or vice versa, it's not enough just to forsake evil, we must also be actively engaged in doing good for the Lord. But let's look at each of these aspects. Depart from evil. There is a promiscuous teaching in some churches today that because God has forgiven the Christian, the Christian can live any which way they please. I don't see that in the Bible. But you hear it like this. They'll pray and they'll thank God for giving all their sins, past, present and future. It sounds good, except it's unbiblical. Find me a chapter and verse that says you can ask God to forgive you for the sin you're about to commit. No, it doesn't work that way. That's just an old teaching, it used to be called the antinomians. It's been coughed up and regurgitated again for modern consumption. But the Bible tells us to depart from evil, to turn away from it, to not walk in those ways anymore. Romans chapter 6 is a wonderful chapter where the Apostle Paul speaks of God's grace and his mercy and his willingness and readiness to forgive the sinner. And he says where sin abounded, God's grace did much more abound. But then he asks the question, so shall we continue in sin that we might enjoy more of God's grace? And what was Paul's answer? God forbid. Absolutely not. The whole point in our coming to Christ was recognizing that we were sinners and that we thought uh, there was a... a, 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 a a, a, a humility and a forgiveness, a, 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 a repentant spirit wanting to get away from that and a need for the Lord and for His uh, righteousness in your life. And so why in forsaking the sin and the world and turning, would you want to go back and live in it anymore? That's the point that Paul's making in Romans 6. No, he said, do not let sin have dominion in your hearts any longer, but yield your bodies as instruments of righteousness unto God, to serving Him. So depart from evil, and he says, do good. Christians are to be known for doing good. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine that others may see your good works and bring glory to your Father in heaven, not to you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works. For this is what God has before ordained that we should do. We should walk in the, in the ways of goodness. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14 speaks of us being zealous for good works. These are so many more passages. They're not recommendations. These are commands. Commands from God's word. To depart from evil and to do good. Fill your time with doing good and you won't have any time left over for evil to work its way back into your life. Someone might ask, how do I know what is good and right for me to do? And when it's not? I mean, sometimes it is not always clear, and I'll be the first one to admit it. Sometimes you're faced with choices, and it's not always clear which way to go. Simple rule of thumb, what would Jesus do? And to find that out, go to God's Word. Read, pray about it, seek guidance from other Christians. God will give you the clear, uh, the clarity and the understanding that you seek. Depart from evil and do good. 
So we see that the one who properly worships the Lord is one who has a deep respect for the Lord. One who talks right. One who seeks to live right. But there is one final characteristic singled out here for our attention. It's the end of verse 14. Yes, depart from evil, do good, but seek peace and pursue it. It's an interesting thought. Seek peace and pursue it. Now the peace being talked about here, as I've mentioned before, is not what we normally think of. A quiet and calm day without any noise or conflict. It is that sometimes, but so much more. Think about it in terms of uh, machinery. Um, I, I, I love to get in a car and turn it on and the car work beautifully and smoothly. That's what's can be talked about. The quietness of machinery that's working smoothly. Have you ever gotten in your car and turned on the key and there's a noise, <coughs> there's a rattle, there's a shaking you don't like? It sends fear through uh, through me. I just wonder how much this is going to cost me before I get through with it all. You know? But it's the idea. It's not quietness because the machinery has been turned off and isn't working, but it's the quietness of machinery that's working smoothly as it should. It's a beautiful hum to it. The biblical term for peace has a much wider, broader meaning than what we usually think of. It's just a bit of quiet. The biblical word for peace is total well-being. The sum total of God's goodness. In, middle, in many Middle Eastern countries, a common greeting is to wish someone peace. Shalom or salam, that's what the words mean. They're wishing you peace. They're not necessarily wishing you a quiet day. It's more akin to what we mean when we say wishing somebody all the best. That's what it means. And so when the Bible here tells us to seek peace and to pursue it, what it means is that we should make it a priority to seek the best in others. Or to do our best to help others, to be all that we can for others. It's the exact opposite of selfish living or greedy living. God did not give us life and bread so that we could spend all our lives on ourselves. We're here that we might also be a blessing and a help, a strength and encouragement to others in some way. To show kindness, to show understanding or care whenever we have the opportunity. Seek peace and pursue it, that's what it means. Let's stop for a minute and just consider the full implication of this command. Think about the people you dealt with this past week. Maybe the people in your life at this moment, that annoying person at work or at school. Think about your family, your neighbors, perhaps the people sitting right here in our church this morning. Can you honestly say in your heart that this is what motivates you in all your relationships with others, that you're seeking their best? That what you said about them the other day was it because you genuinely cared for them and were seeking only to encourage the best in them? When you did what you did to them last week, was your motivation purely to bring out the best in them or did you have other motives? God's word commands us to seek peace and pursue it. And the scriptures are not mincing words here. You find as you get through the scriptures, it's quite searching. It's not easy to live up to. This isn't optional. We are to pursue it. We're to chase after it. To hunt it down. Like hunting dogs. Seeking their prey. Have you ever seen hunting dogs go to it? We had, uh, when we stayed with uh, Marcy's uh, 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 sister and brother-in-law, they live up in the mountains of Virginia. And uh, they had hunting dogs for a time. They had to keep them inside the kennels, locked up. Nice big kennels. They, they're very nicely done. But uh, they couldn't let them out running wild because what would happen? Those hunting dogs would take off. The minute they get a scent of anything, they're off. It's instinctive. It's bred in them. And if you've ever watched hunting dogs, when they get the scent for something, nothing stops them. They're off like a shot. And, uh, and you better be fit and able to keep up with them or you're going to lose them out there in the woods. But you can hear them yelping. And, and you see the dogs, when they've cornered their prey, uh, they, they leave no stone unturned until they find what they're looking for. And that's the word that's being used here to encourage us to pursue after peace. Don't rest until you've got it. Don't rest until you've done your very best for God and for one another. This 
is the kind of person who can worship God, who honors God with their worship. We are to worship the Lord, but we're to worship Him not from proud or selfish or arrogant or bitter or unkind hearts, but we're to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And that's not all. There's one more thing I want to bring to your attention before I leave this psalm altogether. You see, worship is not a one-sided activity. It's not just about what we bring to God. Worship is a mutually beneficial activity. God doesn't have to do anything for us, but He does. He blesses those who worship Him. God doesn't owe us a thing. He's God. He's the Creator. He gave us life and breath. We owe Him worship because of all that He has done for us, because it's His due. But you see, God's not sitting on His throne, removed in splendid isolation, waiting for us to come to Him. God's intimately involved in our lives right now at this moment. He is seeking to promote the best in us. <laughs> Verse 15 tells us that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears are open unto the cry. God's attention is focused on you. I find this very difficult to imagine. I mean, it's not, he's not like a mother or a father that's got, you know, several children. You can hardly keep up with uh, one of them, let alone the whole bunch. And uh, we had three, and there was two of us, you know, and, and still, to try and keep track of our kids in the day wasn't always the easiest thing to do. Uh, but this, God's not like us. His resources are unlimited. He's not limited by the constraints of time and space like we are. So that when you go to the Lord with your troubles and your cares, He already knows all about them. Look at verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. But the righteous, when they cry, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. When you go to Him in prayer, He already knows your need, and He already knows how best to meet it. He knows all about your troubles, and you may cast all your care on Him, for He cares for you. So we see the attentiveness of the Lord. Verse 18 speaks of the nearness of the Lord. The Lord is nigh or near unto them that are of a broken heart, and saves such as be of a contrite spirit. That idea again of God resisting the proud, giving grace to the humble. The Lord is not distant. You might think of him sometimes as seated upon his throne, high and lifted up. But the Bible assures us that we have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. The Lord is especially near to those who are in need. For he's the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Verse 19 goes on to say, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. The deliverance of the Lord is a theme running through this whole psalm. David had been in a very difficult place in his life, and God delivered him out of it. It took years, but God brought him safely through. Sometimes that deliverance, God's deliverance, takes a form that we don't expect. We have an idea in our minds of what it takes to get out of our problems, but God often sees it from another perspective. Sometimes His deliverance might mean you're going down a difficult path, a torturous way, full of puzzling twists and turns. But trust in the Lord and in His goodness. He will not lead you astray. He will bring you safely through. And you will be able to say like the psalmist, Many were the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered me out of them all. <coughs> we see the salvation of the Lord in verse 21. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trusted him shall be desolate. The wicked shall have the reward. A day is coming. When God will right all wrongs, and none shall escape his judgments. But notice in closing who it is that the Lord will redeem. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. None of them that trust in him shall be desolate. 
those who trust in the Lord. Here we are in the Old Testament, but the message of the New Testament is exactly the same, isn't it? Verse 8, David says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in Him. Jesus comes and says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him, that's trusting in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore be justified by faith, trusting in the Lord. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about faith. That is the core, the essence of what is required of an individual that would worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. How is it with you this morning? I can't see into your hearts. That's something that really is just between you and the Lord. But I can tell you this. God knows those who are His. God knows the true heart from the false one. Because He can see into your heart and knows what's there. He knows the heart that trusts in Him in serving truth. And His eyes are upon the righteous and His ears are open to their cry. The Bible tells us that the way to God is through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. If you're here this morning and you're trusting in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then let's take up the psalmist's challenge and let's worship the Lord together. Let's bless Him from a humble and grateful heart. Let His praise be continually in our mouths. Let's magnify and exalt the Lord together, for He is worthy. So if you thought then from the 34th Psalm, trust there's something there that God can use to help you to be a blessing in your life in some way. If there's something that I've said today that has raised a question or a concern in your own soul, I invite you to come to let Jesus have His way in your life today. I'm happy to be with you and to talk with you further. And uh, you can know that God, uh, all is well between you and the Lord. Let's close by singing